12.9 million barrels of oil every day. That's how much crude oil the United States technically consumes. 12.9 million barrels each and every day. On the other side of the ledger, we have production. The United States currently produces around 13 million barrels of oil each and every day. All right, so that's parity, right? Dead even, which means we import about 8.5 million barrels of oil every day. Wait, what? That's right. The United States produces enough crude oil to supply the entire nation, so we theoretically don't have to look outside of the U.S. for oil. On paper, that is. In reality, oil is a lot murkier than that. Pun intended. So let's find out why Republicans and Democrats continue to talk about achieving energy independence. UNFTR. Let's begin with some fun facts. More than 18,000 miles of abandoned oil pipes lay on the ocean floor in the Gulf of Mexico. There are more dormant oil wells in the Gulf than there are productive ones, about 14,000 in fact. To cap the ones in federal waters with concrete would cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $30 billion. And that's what's supposed to happen when a rig and its wells are decommissioned. Instead, the two agencies with regulatory and enforcement oversight, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, have simply looked the other way. So that's just a sampling of the waste associated with crude oil production in just one part of the United States, the Gulf of Mexico. In terms of active capacity, according to Baker Hughes, a company that's tracked oil and gas rig activity since 1944, there are about 585 active oil rigs throughout the United States, most of which are on land. There's somewhere around 18 to 20 active offshore rigs, each of which can manage up to 80 wells at a time, and most of those are in the Gulf of Mexico, dotted amongst the aforementioned abandoned rigs. This is just oil we're talking about now. We're not even touching on gas or renewable energy sources, just pure crude oil. This infrastructure alone allows the United States to pump 22% of the world's supply of crude oil. The next largest producer is Saudi Arabia at 11%. So we're double the next largest. Now, some people probably find this surprising since we paint nations such as Iran and Saudi Arabia, Venezuela as petrostates. But in terms of sheer production, we're double the next largest oil producing country. So we have hundreds of oil rigs on land, a bunch in the ocean, abandoned pipelines strewn about the ocean floor, dormant rigs on top of wells that could just have huge methane blowouts at any time, and no regulator holding them accountable. If our country was a person, they would be bathing in oil, they'd be brushing their teeth with it and pouring it down the sink. And yet, we're still bringing in eight and a half million barrels each and every day from other countries, which pumps air into the windbag politicians who claim we're dependent on foreign oil. To unpack this, let's consider a few factors. One, even if we doubled the amount of oil that we pulled from the ground, we would still bring it in from other countries because we can't afford to, and shouldn't, expand our infrastructure. Two, the type of crude oil that we produce isn't ideally suited for all of the uses for it. And three, domestic production doesn't exactly correlate to crude oil prices on market exchanges because it's a globally priced commodity. We're just a piece of it. Other oil producing nations can increase or decrease production and reserves to impact exchange prices, so it's not just always about us. Now, the third point is self-explanatory, so let's address the others and talk about infrastructure. Here's how the logistics work. The crude oil infrastructure is generally located near the areas in which it's extracted. And it makes sense, right? Refineries, storage facilities, and transportation hubs are centralized in these areas. If we wanted to evenly distribute oil throughout the country to reduce our so-called dependence on foreign sources, we would build a hub-and-spoke network of pipelines across the country like a spider web and have multiple refineries. So that means that every region, every city, every town would have refineries and storage facilities. And nobody wants that. So instead, we complement our pipelines with oil tankers and train cars to move certain distillates throughout the country. On the coasts, we bring it in through the ports from other destinations so that we don't have to build refineries and pipelines in your backyard. And regarding our second point about the types of crude, some of the distillates we bring in from foreign sources are more suited to the end production goal that they're being used for. Some oil is refined for standards meant for, let's say, engines. Others are used for home heating oil or producing plastics. 
Now, I know the extraction and combustion of this stuff is killing the planet, but I'm just talking about the science behind it. Learning about distillates is like studying to become a sommelier. Good evening, sir. Would you care to see our oil menu? Oh, yes, please. Uh, can you make any recommendations? Of course. I can make several pairing recommendations with our tasting menu this evening. From our friends in the north, we have an excellent West Canadian Select, a complex oil with a high sulfur content and just a hint of bitumen. Pairs excellent with the oil slick pigeon, which is prepared medium rare with shavings of tractor tires. Ah, I had oil slick pigeon just last week. But of course, staying in the high sulfur content, we also have a 24 Merban from Dubai. It's a light sour crude with a high fuel oil content that goes well with the plastic filled tuna the chef has adorned with Dorito bags and cigarette butts from the plastic island in the Pacific. Ooh, tempting. Do you have anything on the lighter side though? But of course, we have a limited selection of Bonny Light from Nigeria, a sweet high middle distillate that perfectly complements the Rigatoni alla Petroleum served on an expended lithium battery with a hint of methane and a trace of formaldehyde. Mmm, I think we have a winner. To hear Republicans tell the story, the country still needs to drill baby drill. And the Biden administration has hobbled the industry, making us vulnerable to some mysterious foreign adversaries. And yet, under the Biden administration, the top five oil and gas companies have pulled in more than $250 billion in profits between 2021 and 2023. So instead of focusing on this as a bad thing that's preventing serious investments into a renewable future, the Democrats are also running this fact proudly and taking credit for expanding the number of leases and the historic rate of U.S. production. The Biden-Harris administration has routinely touted the fact that there are 9,000 open licenses on federal land that oil and gas companies have yet to utilize. And this is absolutely true. There's nothing the government is doing right now to impede the extraction or production of oil and gas from land in the continental United States or immediately offshore. See, technological breakthroughs in horizontal drilling and the detection of proven reserves has made the current operations vastly more efficient than they used to be, thereby making it inefficient and costly to start up a new operation. But there just isn't a need to do so. And yet, the narrative persists that we're still reliant on foreign oil, which makes us somehow vulnerable to bad actors. But 95% of the oil that we import comes from staunch allies of the United States that could hardly be characterized as bad actors. I mean, Canada is responsible for 50% of the imports, with Mexico, Brazil, and Iraq making up the balance. Only 5% comes from what a normal person would consider a bad actor on the world stage, and that's Saudi Arabia. But they're still a staunch ally, so this narrative is completely false. Although I have to say, we should never fully trust those Canadians. I mean, they look like us, talk like Minnesotans, and keep smiling and skating. I call bullshit. No one's that nice. Anywho, when Russia invaded Ukraine, the Biden administration sanctioned the import of Russian oil and shut it off like a spigot overnight. And nothing happened. Because we have options. During the supply chain crisis, we even started importing a limited amount of oil again from Venezuela, but we can shut that off in an instant as well. So the short answer here is that we are, in fact, very much energy independent. We choose to be a net exporter of oil, meaning we don't use 100% of what we produce because it makes practical and economic sense to do so. We sell the stuff that others need and bring in what suits our needs from our closest allies because it would be lunacy to build a pipeline and refinery in every neighborhood in America. Of course, there's another massive cost here borne by the inhabitants of the planet that registers on the federal balance sheet, but not the income statements of the oil and gas companies themselves. The IMF estimates that the harmful effects of pollution from fossil fuel production cost the United States around $646 billion every year. Now, they arrive at this by adding up the real cost of wildfires, droughts, and premature deaths from heat and pollution. Now, in very direct and traceable terms, the U.S. government still hands the oil and gas industry somewhere in the neighborhood of $20 billion a year in subsidies. Put another way, holding back just 18 months of that, could cover the cost to cap all of those abandoned wells waiting to blow methane and pollute the Gulf of Mexico. Put another way, a quarter of the oil and gas profits are directly tied to handouts from the U.S. government. That's called corporate welfare. Energy independence from other countries isn't the goal. 
reducing our dependence upon fossil fuel energy sources is the goal. And it's rather unbelievable that the Democratic Party feeds into the energy independence narrative by boasting about open leases and standing behind the oil and gas industry. It's just not that complicated, but both parties treat us like we're idiots. I mean, let's role play a debate between a typical Republican and a clearly fake Democrat that we wish was real. Welcome back to the Decision 2024 debate. Generic Republican, the next question goes to you. As president, what would your energy policy be? Well, the far left radical Biden administration has made us vulnerable by attacking our oil industry under the Green New Deal. If elected, I promise to invest in our oil and gas companies and clear the way to expand drilling throughout the United States and create good paying jobs on our way to being energy independent. Make America great again. Imaginary Democratic candidate, your response. Thanks for the question. Here's my quick answer. We're already energy independent and none of you have any idea what you're talking about. Please stop treating the American people like they're stupid. Now here's the reason why in a longer answer. Number one, renewable energy jobs are the fastest growing jobs in America. Fact, look it up. Number two, American oil and gas companies don't need investments from the United States. They already receive $20 billion in subsidies each year, and the top five fossil fuel companies posted $250 billion in profits between 2021 and 2023. Number three, there are 9,000 unused oil leases on federal lands already because the oil companies said they don't need them. And four, we already produce more oil than we use. We bring in oil from our closest allies because it's more cost effective to do that. The alternative would be to build a pipeline line through every neighborhood in the country and a refinery in every town. Lastly, the Green New Deal doesn't exist, but it should. And I'm happy to talk about it because we're killing the planet, reducing life expectancies, and subsidizing the wrong industries. Imagine having a candidate that actually talked to us like this, that spoke the truth and dismantled all of these fraudulent talking points. I have to say that before we talk about oil production, I think the necessity that we face is transforming our energy system away from oil and fossil fuel to energy efficiency and to sustainable energy. Oh wait, that's right. We did. 